Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Ultimate Franchise Fantasy Sports Podcast number 12. Larry, the fish, or fish, I should say, Darren, and a special guest today, Larry, on the program. Going to be an exciting day. We're going to learn a ton here, man. Yeah, I'm here to here to listen, here to learn. Absolutely. Uh, it's uh, exciting to be joined by Blockchain Andy and then looking forward to picking his brain on all things blockchain as well as cryptocurrency. Absolutely. Welcome to the show, Blockchain Andy. How are you doing over there in the UK? Thanks, guys. It's it's actually really good over here at the minute. Um, looking forward to helping where I can in explaining the blockchain he is and why Zilliqa is the best choice for UFS moving forward. Well, we're certainly interested in hearing about that. So today we're going to be focusing on, uh, well, we're going to, we're going to learn a lot about uh, cryptocurrency, Zilliqa, Zilocracy, and any other mind-blowing uh, stuff that, that you want to fill our heads with. Um, if we have time at the end of the program, we're going to get into the overall power rankings that uh, Larry's been really busy with, submitted by our very own UFHL community ranking, the franchise is 1 to 31, any major trades and acquisitions the last couple of weeks. The American Hockey League, we're uh, doing some stuff with here, Blockchain Andy, it's going to be interesting. And uh, yes, any other interesting ideas that have been thrown our way from our UFHL community. But let's start things off with Blockchain Andy, and thank you so much for taking your evening to join us because as we record this it's uh this morning where larry is it's just nicely afternoon where i am but i'm sure it's into the evening where you are you're in lockdown i'm in lockdown there's not much else to do other than do podcasts learn about cryptocurrency and first of all what i should ask you about because i know uh, you know talking off uh off camera here blockchain andy you've got a major event you're setting up uh up for that starts tomorrow tell us a little bit about that yeah, we're actually setting up with um, alongside Zilliqa for the Singapore FinTech Festival. So Zilliqa is the main kind of feature. And then they've gave booths to all the projects that are offside. So this is like the Zill Hive project and Zillocracy. So we'll have booths going on throughout the whole five days. And then we'll be able to talk to people and engage and spread the word of Zilliqa and Zillocracy. Okay, so, so why... Why do you feel that UFFS is in good hands with Zillica? In fact, I, I we feel that way, but we always like to hear it from the other side. Zillica, we're, we're really excited, working hard to uh, get into a testing phase, uh, launching with Zillica here sometime probably in January 2021. But why are we in good hands with Zillica? Well, Zillica's kind of set the standard by making blockchain more safe and secure. They kind of took the approach where all the software gets audited and tested like very vigorously before anything gets released to the public. So the team kind of nurture it and make sure it's ready before releasing it. So this kind of adds an extra level of security and reliability onto their products. And the team itself has been actively developing from 2017. So the blockchain they've got now is actually so more advanced than most of us out there. So... I fully believe by building on Zillica, you're building on the best blockchain available. So you're definitely in safe hands. Well, that's what we think. And, and I like the uh, security portion of that. That makes me feel very comfortable. And I'm sure it makes any, uh, any of our franchise owners and partners, as well as scouts, very comforted as well. Because obviously, uh, when they own an asset, they want that asset to appreciate in value. And I think security comes along with uh, you know, big time in owning an asset that, especially when it appreciates to a value that's quite significant. Yeah, definitely. So blockchain, Andy, give us a little bit of a background on, on yourself, if you wouldn't mind. Um, how long have you been involved in cryptocurrency? It sounds like you're pretty well versed. So this is, uh, you know, I, I'm a newbie. Um, we talked about this already to, to cryptocurrency, uh, but yourself, it sounds like this has been something that's uh, you've been, you've been playing around with for quite a while. Um, I actually joined cryptocurrency and started investing back in 2017. It was about October, November, just before the big rush. And since then, I've just been educating myself by writing articles, producing videos, and starting off with Zillocracy. So kind of been getting different roles and jobs in the sector to try and educate myself and to help people as much as possible is what I try and do over my YouTube channel. Mm-hmm. And I've, I've watched uh, certainly some of your videos and I'm learning a lot by watching those. 
what's interesting is you stumbled across uh, UFFS and Larry himself was, was asking me, how did, how did blockchain Andy stumble across, uh, across UFFS? Well, what actually happened is, um, I think one of my friends, CM Top Dog, reached out to us a while ago about building on Zilliqa. And then I spoke to him and he mentioned that this project's got a lot of potential. So I remember I reached out to Honch, I think it was. Yep. He was Honch. part of your team. And he asked me if I would be interested in researching and doing a video on you guys and basically help out with a bit of content for marketing. So I was speaking to the Honch. I helped out where I could released a video and then realized that this project could be really big for the Zilliqa blockchain. And I think uh, we think it's going to be huge and we're extremely happy to be uh, teaming up with, with Zilliqa. Larry, you've been, uh, you've been really active and working really hard. And, and sometimes we call Larry the fish, by the way, blockchain Andy, because uh, you know, if we're, if we're ever looking for information, we just go to the fish. It's like fishing for information. And he comes up with the answer instantly. This guy's <laughs> encyclopedic. Uh, mine for hockey and, and some other sports as well. And we'll get into that later. But, uh, you know, he's, uh, he's been working on, on building this, this landing page and what it's going to look like. And uh, looks like it's going to be pretty exciting, Larry. Yeah, for sure. And, and my background is in media as well as the, the fantasy sports side. So like Darren, I'm quite new to the crypto side, new to the blockchain. So I'm uh, enjoying just listening to Andy and picking his brain and uh, certainly, it's exciting moving on to the blockchain because we've been doing it all kind of off, off chain right now, and so we can't wait to get on chain and 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 see it work in in real time and see how everything's going to come together. So we're super excited about the project, and for me, I'm just excited to see uh, the potential, like Andy talks about, of digital asset ownership going forward. Uh, it's kind of a, a fairly new concept in the mainstream uh, in the present, but. I just like to get Andy's feedback and an opinion on, on where digital asset ownership is going in the future and why projects like this have as much potential as uh, people believe they do. Um, I really think that digital assets and NFTs is definitely the future of collectibles and to make more revolutionary games where you actually fully physically and, and digitally own something. Because if you look out there, there's a lot of hype trends so if we just talk about the Pokemon trend recently, just to talk about it. So these are physical assets um, and there's no way to verify if they're real or be able to trace back to where they've been bought, etc. But if you move that onto the blockchain, you're verifying that the asset's real and that you can follow it back to who owned it before you, etc. And when it was created. So adding something like UFF to this could be really revolutionary and it could really show proof of ownership to the next level. And just the number of transactions too. I know uh, we just have the one league going right now, the, the Ultimate Fantasy Hockey League, our version of the, the NHL Fantasy League. And, you know, towards the end of November, uh, there hasn't been any hockey in months and we're still averaging 14 transactions per day. And you can imagine when we get, you know, dozens of sports and, and potentially hundreds of leagues, uh, the, the number of transactions that it'll do and maybe talk a little bit about Zillica and, and their blockchain with regards to uh, speed and also uh, the relative uh, um, inexpensive transaction fees compared to some of the other blockchains that are out there too. So it's uh, the speed and the cost, uh, both are beneficial to being on the Zillica blockchain is my understanding. Yeah, definitely. Um, the problem with blockchain is a lot of blockchains hasn't built much infrastructure to be able to handle the high throughput needed. So the Zilliqa blockchain can handle up to, I think it's 2,880 transactions per second. So this is nearly double what Visa does currently. So to have that much transaction speed and with the fees being so minimal, it'll allow people to buy and send and trade stuff so much easier on the blockchain. If you used Ethereum, it, it could cost anything up to $10 to send something. Wow. This, you know, what you're just describing there, the, the number of transactions, dub, more than double of what Visa currently does. That's, I can't even get my head around that, uh, Andy. That is, uh, that's phenomenal. And to have the infrastructure to be able to handle that, that's got to be key. That has to be key. Otherwise, this whole thing just falls apart. Yeah, um, the Zilliqa infrastructure was built is, I think it was 2,400 nodes originally that were owned by the Zilliqa team to get the transactions so high. But 
over the years, they've been reducing the nodes down to make the network more decentralized. So the nodes now on the network are mostly owned by community members and people who want to get a slice of the transactions. So to send a transaction on Zilliqa at the minute, it's, I think, 0.002 Zilliqa. So you're literally talking like fractions of cents to send a transaction compared to dollars on the Ethereum network. Well, obviously, uh, that's music to my ears. And if we can get those fees as low as possible, um, that makes, you know, as many transactions as we're, we're doing in our platform already. And that will obviously uh, expand almost infinitesimally. That, that's very important because it becomes cost prohibitive otherwise. So blockchain, Andy, tell me about, you know, I, I've watched, you know, a few of your videos on, on YouTube and I love your intro music, by the way, I was playing it the other day and my son came walking out. He says, what, what, what are those weird uh, spaceship type noises? And, and I said, well, this is, this is blockchain Andy's music. So uh, you definitely have a signature, uh, <laughs> I guess, music to, to open up uh, your videos. And I was, I was watching this and you talk a lot about Zilocracy. Can you, can you give us the kind of the Coles notes on that? What is Zilocracy all about? Um, well, Zilocracy kind of started as like a project out of a university team in Singapore and they wanted to make a Chardon blockchain. So the Chardon blockchain is like a blockchain where they've got so many nodes and the transactions get split between the nodes to make it faster and more scalable. So when you scan the transaction on Zilliqa, it goes to one node and then the rest of the information goes to the other nodes. So it builds the transaction over like by splitting it over so many nodes. So this is the Chardon effect of the network. Um, they first released a paper on it in 2016, 17, and people thought it couldn't be done. They thought that it was just not going to happen. So they managed to make the Zilliqa team and piece together this blockchain. I think it took a year of development. And then the mainnet was released in 2018. Um, and ever since then, it's just been history. The networks work flawlessly. I yeah, know that's great, Andy. And one thing that's exciting too, uh, I know on the UFF sports platform uh, from the crypto side is that uh, we do have a stable coin in development, the, the score coin, we're calling it SCO as the currency. Uh, talk a little bit about the potential with developing uh, your own uh, tokens and in-game coins and, and just uh, to have your own stable coin. What, what does that mean for the, the UFF sports platform for, for our franchises? Because like Darren mentioned, uh, many of our current franchise owners and, and people that are involved in our UFFS and, and UFHL community come from that fantasy sports background and they're trying to wrap their head around the, the crypto side and and you know they haven't had a ton of experience with the score coin yet because it's in development and we're, we're working off chain with some fiat money right now but just talk about the the upside of, of having your own stable coin and and what the score coin can mean uh, on the blockchain once uh, we launch with zilliqa hopefully in mid-january so the cryptocurrency one of the biggest in my opinion negatives of cryptocurrency is that there's a lot of variation in crypto price. So by having a stable coin, you're setting the price of that token and it won't really move from it. So stable coins in the crypto space pay like one of the biggest parts because Bitcoin can drop and move about $1,000 a day at a time. But when you've got a stable coin, that always stays around about the $1 mark if you think about the dollar pegged stable coins. So by UFF having a stable coin, this will protect your assets in turn. So if you hold the score token, you know your assets aren't really going to move up and down too much and it'll stay true to the value. So by the platform itself developing this, this could be really key for transfers, buy and sell and moving forward. Yeah, and that's what we're looking at uh, is to, to use it as an in-game currency to be able to, uh, to do all the different transactions. And obviously, uh, as as the fish already pointed out, we've we've had many transactions up to fourteen a day with one current uh, league in operation called the Ultimate uh, Fantasy Hockey League and expanding into many others. So this is something that's going to come uh, you know really really into play here. The other thing that's that's important to you know I should point out and, and give you a feel for what we're about because I'm not sure I know you've uh, you'd, you've explored the UFFS a little bit. But what makes this a little bit unique, Blockchain Andy, is the fact that 
you you own a player, which we'll call an asset, and you'll own that player forever unless you trade that asset or player or or sell it. Now, the other thing is, is players, as you would know in your football uh, experience, as you're a, you're a passionate fan, you tell us in the UK, is that these players, they don't last forever. They do retire. So we also have plans to have Legends Leagues that we could uh, do in simulation. You know, the EA games is, uh, EA Sports is, is kind of a big deal. Uh, you know, you get some good players playing tournaments and stuff like that. They fill arenas. So we, we do have plans to, you know, someday hopefully at least explore, maybe get into that aspect. So you still own the asset, becomes a legend once they retire. And you can also then buy and, and uh, trade that asset. And the other unique thing about our league is that you also continue to own the assets. And a lot of fantasy sports don't do this blockchain anywhere. The regular season ends, then you get into playoffs. And a lot of fantasy sports, it kind of stops at the end of the regular season. They pay out the winners, life moves on. Ours continues into the playoffs, and we actually you know, award a cup at the end. And then there's a whole pile that's a little bit complicated to get into, but there's a, there's a lot of leasing of your assets to other teams that did not make the playoffs, which becomes very unique in the fantasy sports realm. I don't know if you're aware of that, but what are your thoughts on some of that? Um, I definitely think continuing assets into Legend League, etc., is really good to protect your value. So and if, if every year that if you bought an asset and then at the end of the year you lost it and you didn't make the playoffs and you had to buy it again the next year, that would really put off so many people in the leagues, etc. So I think by you protecting what you buy, is a player going into the next seasons, et cetera, could be really key and could set you guys apart from different fantasy leagues out there already. But from what I understand, I think that you guys are the first on blockchain. Am I right? I'm not clear on that. Maybe Larry knows better, but to be honest, I'm not sure. Uh, you know, the world moves so fast uh, and I can't keep up. I'm not sure if we're, uh, we might've been the first and I, uh, I don't know where we're at on that. Do you know, Larry? Yeah, that's the goal, to be first to market, first to be live on chain doing fantasy sports and digital asset ownership within the, the fantasy realm. So we're on track to be the first. And uh, like I said, the, the ideal, the projected launch is mid-January and hopefully be able to rapidly expand from there, add some more hockey leagues, as Darren alluded to, and then build out uh, the rest of the ecosystem with other sports uh, coming on chain, hopefully in the the years to come and certainly as quickly as possible. So that's exciting. And you mentioned the Legends League. Uh, that's where it gets more into that collectible side. There will be some gameplay, but primarily the Legends Leagues will all be all about the collectibles. And you'll have, uh, you know, the Wayne Gretzky's, all these retired players, the best ever, will be brought back onto the chain as Legends and, and auctioned off and, and owned, which is huge. And that's where sort of uh, the Crypto Kitties model sort of comes into play a bit with the Legends League because uh as much as the the gameplay will be fun in the ultimate fantasy hockey league the current uh based on real world stats in the nhl but when you bring in the legends that's where uh like i said it becomes more about the collectibles and and certainly uh can be relatable to the success that crypto kitties has had is the sort of the vision of the legends league yeah you kind of see this already on ea sports where they've brought the legends back haven't they for the fifa game so I definitely think the market's out there to bring the legends back. And I definitely think it would add a lot more value to the leagues. So I definitely think it's a great idea. And I think it's going to drive the platform forward, moving forward. So blockchain, Andy, you know, what's really, what's really interesting to me, and, and hopefully you can put some clarity to this or your opinion, I guess, is, you know, certainly valuable. But we, we start out, uh, we, we know sports. Uh, you know, we, we didn't know as much about cryptocurrency going in but we saw an opportunity. We wanted to be innovative and we wanted to be first on something that simply hasn't been done in the world before. And this is why we're getting onto the blockchain. We're getting into cryptocurrency and, and creating our own stable coin. Now, obviously, first and foremost, we bring fantasy sports uh, advocates or passionate sports and right now hockey people into our community. And with that, they have to get into cryptocurrency and the blockchain. And a lot, it's a learning process for most of them. Now let's flip this thing on the head and let's talk about the other way. What do you think the appetite or the uptake will be in bringing cryptocurrency people into what we're doing if they don't know that much about sports? Is it going to be an investment to them? How do you see this taking shape? Well, from being in the crypto space for so long now, I kind of see the 
people in the crypto space kind of always look out for the next big investment. When you look at things like crypto kitties, etc., people weren't really interested in cats, were they? They were more interested in getting the most rare, desirable cats they can to be able to move forward and sell it for a lot more money. So a lot of people out there really do like fantasy sports. And I actually Googled it before I came on. I think it's like 460 million people are into fantasy sports around the globe. So when you think about that in the terms of cryptocurrency, there must be so many people out there that play fantasy sports and appreciate fantasy sports without actually knowing. So the barrier we've hit with Zillocracy as well is education. So we are actually focusing a lot into education and to show people what the Zillica blockchain can do and the different kind of apps and dApps that are being released off it. So with the right marketing and the right education platform, I definitely think UFF can really tap into the crypto space and get more people to invest. Absolutely. Music to my ears. Uh, that's, that's what we're thinking. So I appreciate your, uh, your input on that. And I think, uh, you know, obviously we started with hockey because we knew that best. And if we're going to build something from the ground up, uh, you know, with nothing but, uh, you know, a piece of paper and, and some internet connections off the start is basically how we started. We wanted to go with something that we knew. Now, when we start to get into NFL football, uh, you know, which we do plan to, and soccer, as we call soccer, you call football in Europe and the other parts of the world, certainly one of the biggest sports, you know, I, I don't know if it, if it tops cricket, but cricket's up there too, then this this is just going to be mind-boggling on the potential i think yeah definitely um as i was saying before the podcast like i don't really follow nhl that much but i know that football on this side of the world is the number one sport and there's so many supporters across europe and the uk so once a football league starts like based on the premier league and the european league i think it would really take off and you'll get so many new people wanting to invest and join the leagues like i know so many people in crypto now that play the fantasy football league in the uk based on the premier league website um and i can say for one if there was a league released with where you could buy players and play in the leagues to win prizes i would definitely get involved straight away i hope you will get involved yeah, I think that's uh, going to be a, a huge part of the platform going forward, the, the European soccer leagues, uh, as well as we can do the World Cups and, and the Olympics and stuff too. We can do tournament type setting type uh, one-off events as well. Uh, but certainly the, the leagues are going to be the bread and butter. And, and we look forward to having football slash soccer being uh, the powerhouses on football on both sides of the pond. Uh, the NFL obviously is the the biggest fantasy sport in North America and with the biggest uptake. And then in Europe, uh, obviously the European football, or as we call it, soccer is huge. So I think uh, just the valuations of everything as it grows is going to be the, the exciting part because you do see what a, a rare, valuable uh, crypto kitty sells for it. And I guess that's sort of where we're going with UFFS as well and why scarcity was such a, a big important factor for us because all the other fantasy platforms have a million NHL leagues and you know that many different people own Connor McDavid but here at UFFS and, and the Ultimate Fantasy Hockey League everything is going to be one-to-one -one, uh, real world to, to the crypto world or to the blockchain so there will only be one Connor McDavid or or you know one uh, star soccer player uh, Ronaldo or whoever so y the value will grow exponentially uh, based on the scarcity. And I think that's something that uh, our franchise owners are, are starting to grasp is that uh, how valuable these individual assets are because there's only one of them. Maybe you can speak to the scarcity factor and how that was a, a good idea for bringing fantasy sports onto the blockchain, as opposed to mass producing a uh, hundreds or thousands of NHL leagues, like other fantasy platforms have done. Yeah, I think having one main league with the one-to-one -one players is the way to go. This is what I would have done if I was building it up from the start. It's kind of like if you could have 50 Abangyangs in the Premier League, that diminishes his value completely. But if you have one Abangyang who scores goals every week and you just buy that player one for one, that sets you aside and gives you an advantage. So people would want that advantage and try and buy it off you, et cetera, and increase the value over time. But I think the really good feature that you guys are adding is the Legend League. So if you own that player when he's a player, 
and then he retires and becomes a legend. This is just going to increase his demand over time as well. So definitely having assets back one to one is the way forward. And I definitely think that if there was more than one player, it would just ruin the league completely, in my honest opinion. Yeah, that's where we're headed. That's what we're looking at. And that was the plan. That was the vision right from the start, Blockchain Andy. The other thing we that's unique to uh, UFFS Sports is we have a scouting uh, feature as well. And this is interesting because it's a little bit, uh, um, I, I guess it's different than, than uh, finding a legend, but you, you, that a legend is already defined on what they have already done or achieved. Now, the scouting feature, we have people that know their sports uh, inside and out, and they go out and they scour the world for you know talent in any particular different sport in our case right now it's just hockey that is 15 years of age or older that is looking like that that asset or that that player could do something so they go and register that that player or that asset on the blockchain they own that player and then they sell that player if that player becomes drafted into a professional league to a franchise owner which is kind of interesting because it it builds a lot of discussion, a lot of community focus. Uh, people are talking about players and what they're doing out there all time is, or, or all the time as they develop. Um, and and it, it's, uh, it's a risk versus reward kind of a thing in a way. If you think about it, you're taking a risk on a player. That player looks good now, might not down the road, might not develop, might not, might not become pro. But uh, if that player does become pro, uh, you registered that player very, very cheaply. And now that player has become an extremely valuable asset. So it's kind of an interesting uh, innovation that we've built into our platform as well. What are your thoughts on something like that? It's kind of um, completing the circle, isn't it, of the whole platform. So it's kind of like replicating the academies out there already in the real life. So when the academies go take a risk and um, bank on all these young players, so it can give the scouts a lot of them um, What's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> it's so scouts that go out there and find players, it can build up their reputation and make sure that they like build their own reputation on your platform so they know what players to look for, what kind of um, players are going to make it in the future. But they, they can also generate money from this as well, right? Absolutely. So the time and effort they put in in scouting players, picking the next big thing could also generate their money as well. So this alone will bring more play, people into the fray that think they know about players and young players that are going to develop into excellent pros moving forward. So I definitely think that this could be a really big thing on the platform as well. And, and it's big for transactions as well, because just the building out the registry and the database, uh, you know, just hockey alone, there, there's literally millions of athletes around the world that play hockey and only 700 make it to the the main professional league, but we're going to have all these other hockey leagues expanded out and growing out as well. So there'll always be a place for a majority of these players to play, but it's exciting because the scouting platform uh, at the end of November, as of December 1st, we had 1,920 hockey players owned and only 700 play in the, in the NHL and in, in our ultimate fantasy hockey league. So uh, just with building the registry and the database and, and the amount of registrations and, and just the amount of assets that that scouting platform brings to the blockchain uh, is huge. The potential there is huge as far as creating that registry and database of, of you know, essentially every athlete in the world, potentially, uh, once they reach a certain age and, and are on the radar for the, the pro leagues and, and, you know, the academies and, and real world scouting will be applied to the blockchain. And so, and like I said, the other thing is to really show your track record. We envision some of these scouts, uh, potentially getting real world jobs uh, from scouting. And a lot of our scouts are already real world scouts, but potentially moving up in the real world because of their success on the blockchain and identifying talent. And, and like I said, finding the next big thing and finding the best prospects that can be profitable, but also uh, just grow the, the ecosystem as a whole by bringing in that many more digital assets as prospects versus just focusing on the pro players. Blockchain, Andy, you, uh, you know, from, from what you said in your comments, uh, I can understand that you completely get this thing. And uh, that's, that's music to my ears. I think we're going to have to uh, make you a regular guest on this program by the looks of it. And, uh, you know, I think we can toss around a lot of interesting ideas and take some of those forward. 
But hey, you know, I wanted to get a little bit more because I'm curious, and it might just be a personal thing as being a, a bit of a crypto rookie, but um, I wanted to get into staking. Why, you know, for the for the people out there that are new to cryptocurrency and, and they do buy, you know, uh, Zilliqa as an example, why should they stake? So the whole term of staking, um, it was actually pitched by a member of the Zillocracy Council to Zillica about making non-custodial staking a feature. So the main feature of non-custodial staking is to take tokens off exchanges because the volatility on exchanges is really high. So if we take tokens off exchanges and reward people for keeping the tokens more secure on their own wallets or their ledgers, it would so they'll get a reward basically for doing that. So you'll take your tokens off exchanges, you'll lock them up for 14 days is the unbonded period, but you'll also get a reward for doing so. So by doing this, you're taking your tokens off exchanges, making them more secure, and making the liquidity more scarce on the different exchanges out there, like Binance. So the price doesn't fluctuate as much as they used to. Right. So okay. it, it's yep. a win-win for the it's a win-win for the blockchain and for the supporters who take their tokens off exchanges to stake. But you'll also get rewarded a GZIL token. So you, when you stake, you get rewarded a GZIL token, which is a governance token, which will help you in the future vote on different things on the Zilliqa blockchain. So it's rewarding the user back with the power to vote on things on the blockchain. Okay. Okay. I didn't realize that. And I have some Zill uh, staked right now. I have not claimed it yet or unstaked it. And I, it's sitting there and I'm not sure what to do with it. So I'm all ears on the staking thing. The other, the other thing you were talking a lot about um, recently in one of your videos was, uh, you know, the concept of some, some fantastic, uh, you know, growth, growth of your, of your asset, I guess, by, by getting into mining or pool farming. It sounded like they kind of went hand in hand. What's that all about? So the pool farming, it's kind of like one of the biggest crazes in crypto space at the minute. So on Zilliqa, the biggest way to do it at the minute is by Zyro Finance. And you basically just add Zilliqa and Zyro tokens to a pool. And that automatically generates tokens by farming them on the network. Like I can't go into too much detail because I'm not really an expert on it. But by doing this, it allows you to get really high APR. But I do have to say, the Zyro Finance platform only came out like a week ago on mainnet. So be very cautious when you're going to put in a lot of Zilliqa or Zyro tokens into it. So it's best just to let it run for a bit, make sure it's 100%, and then you can start investing. Well, it sounds like if you're going to get into this kind of thing, uh, Zilliqa would be the platform to get engaged with it uh, you know, in, the, in this concept because of the security and they... Uh, as you've mentioned in, in some of your videos I've watched, Blockchain Andy, that they, they test and they test and they test and they make sure these things are functioning properly before they're released. So that's very comforting to a guy like me. Yeah, it's, it's, very, it's a, a bit stressful at times when you wait for things to get released, but they'll never release anything unless it's been test like to the extreme. So it's a bit more reassuring for people that are just getting into cryptocurrency now. That sounds, uh, sounds amazing. You know, there's, I think we could talk about this for days and days on end, especially for a crypto rookie like myself. And uh, the main thing is, was to get you on the program, talk a little bit about how Zilliqa and UFFS, uh, you know, can come together and will come together and the value to, to each in doing so. And we certainly hope or envision to, uh, to be bringing a lot of transactions to the Zilliqa blockchain in the very near future. Yeah, that, that, that'll be great for the Zilliqa blockchain. And I think currently they have about 10 million transactions on the mainnet blockchain. And I think this is like the third or fourth highest in the whole crypto space. So the more transactions go through the blockchain, the faster it can become and the cheaper the fees become over time. So I definitely think moving forward, the more transactions that come from you guys will definitely benefit Zilliqa. And the more transactions that happen on a blockchain, does that does that increase the valuation of that particular uh, token as well? In in this case, Zilliqa. Um, when you're talking like businesses and corporations looking into it, if you've got a blockchain that's done over ten million transactions compared to a blockchain that's done 
50,000, you definitely shows the strength in the blockchain with over 10 million. So Zilliqa now is just building a portfolio moving forward to show all these enterprises and organizations that want to build on the blockchain. Okay. Interesting stuff. Fish, do you have any last questions or comments for blockchain, Andy? Just, I'm just excited to, like I said, pick his brain and, and listen and listen and learn today. And, uh, and just to hear him uh, explain just sort of uh, the potential of UFS sports and, and why he feels it's going to be well received uh, by the crypto world and, and kind of that uptake side as well. So it's been uh, like, we, we believe we have a revolutionary idea and, and hopefully first to market with, with uh, combining sort of fantasy sports with the crypto world, which like you said, seems to go hand in hand. And, and we feel Zillica is the, the, the right uh, blockchain to, to really take our project to the next level. So it, it feels like a perfect fit. And, and, and hearing from Andy, uh, it's very reassuring that he sort of believes that as well. And that, uh, the crypto world is, is getting excited for the, the official launch of UFF Sports on the Zilliqa blockchain in January. Yeah, I definitely think there's a lot of, um, there's going to be a lot of people out there that come over to the UFF once it's fully launched. I think the platform itself is revolutionary and I'm fully behind it. And I think it will be really exciting to see how many people actually move over once you go live. Um, like I say, I, I can't wait for you to release like a Premier League or an English Football League because I'll definitely get involved as much as possible. Because I think fantasy football is the fantasy football and fantasy leagues are the way for supporters to really get a grip of the sport and feel like they're a part of it. So I definitely think building it on Zilliqa is the way forward. And I really think this product is going to be massive when it fully launches worldwide. We can't wait for the day. I think we we might have to have you live on uh, on podcast here and do a, do a toast of champagne when that day comes. And it's it's coming pretty soon. And and the sports will continue to uh, to move forward. We'll get into a lot more sports. But obviously, when you when you build something from the ground up, and then we get into the minor leagues underneath, there's a lot of infrastructure on our on our side that needs to take place. And uh, Zilliqa and and the Zilliqa blockchain is only only going to make us more powerful and help us along that that road. Yeah, definitely think so. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. You're welcome to stay on in the rest of the program. We're going to get into a little bit of uh, UFHL talk here, but uh, you talked, uh, you mentioned that you had to catch uh, to catch a game. I think a, a football game is happening on your side of the ocean. Did you did you want to go take care of that? <laughs> yeah, I promised my daughter I would watch the Liverpool Wolves game that started half an hour ago. So I best get back to the kids and watch the game. But thanks very much for having us, guys. It's been a pleasure, and I'll come on anytime you want us. You bet. Thanks for joining. Great to talk to you. All right. Thanks very much. I'll see you later. Bye. Cheers. Well, Fish, that was interesting stuff, man. Uh, you know, I could talk to that guy all day. There, there's so many things that I just don't know, you know? And uh, it, it's very comforting to know that there's people like that that you can talk to to, to get a, a firsthand opinion and I guess share their expertise on how things work. Yeah, I know both of us uh, come from a media background and for myself, uh, obviously a sports media and, and, and fantasy sports. I've been playing fantasy sports for two decades and I know the NHL uh, and the hockey world really well and, and connections there. But again, the, the crypto side and the blockchain as well as just the tech side in general is quite new to me. So it's been a, a learning experience and I learn something every day and certainly uh, picking the brain of somebody like blockchain Andy and you know your question about staking and, and some of the the other uh, topics he touched on that uh, is all new to me I had to really uh, listen in and I'm sure I'll listen back to it a few times to, to pick up on what I might have missed uh, at first at first glance but certainly uh, for our franchise owners our scouts our, our general managers within the ultimate fantasy hockey league I think they learned a lot and uh probably feel, like you said, more secure about their investment and, and certainly excited about the potential once the crypto world attaches and, and they fully embrace uh, the UFF sports once we're on the chain. I think uh, uh, the value of everything, the, the valuations are, are potential. The potential is there for everything to really take off and, and potentially skyrocket. And just just an all around nice guy, just a very pleasurable guy to speak to. And, and he's obviously passionate about sports. Doesn't hurt, doesn't hurt. He's uh, when we get into that football, we're going to be talking a lot to that guy, I think. Yeah, I think uh, European football. Yeah, exactly. When we get into European football, I think uh, 
blockchain Andy's going to be excited. And I know uh, that is the biggest sport in the world, but the sport that most people play and grow up playing again, all you need is a, a ball and a, a pair of feet and you're off to the races with football. So it's, uh, it's taken up in, in every country around the world, every language. And I think uh, that is going to be the, the real, uh, again, just with the, the scouting side of it too, registering, uh, you know, football, what we call soccer athletes, the amount of potential uh, athletes that could be registered on the blockchain is mind blowing. So football is going to be huge. Uh, like I said, on both sides of the pond with the, we know how big the NFL is with uh, sports betting and fantasy sports in, in North America. And certainly we're, we're well aware of uh, the impact of European football on that side of the pond. So that's going to be a, a, an exciting launch when that day comes. But like I said, for now, we're focusing on building out the hockey platform, get some more hockey leagues on board and, and really fine tune everything with hockey because it is what we know best. And then growing uh, our, our side as well, growing, uh, bringing more people into the fold and, and really people that have a better understanding of European football and get them like blockchain Andy to help us launch and, and reach the right people to really uh, be successful from day one with the football launches. Absolutely. There's so many more things to uh, move forward on and, uh, and keep us intrigued into the future for sure. Let's turn our attention to the UFHL. Uh, you know, uh, I know, I know fish, you've been working really hard on, on getting people to submit their, their rankings for the, the power rankings, uh, you know, ranking the franchises one to 31 and man, like I printed it off. I think I had 37 pages to print off on my printer with all the, all the stuff you put together. But I think what was uh, interesting and you can feel free to comment on this is the the variability everybody had different ideas and it, and it was maybe a bit of a departure from what what maybe you, even you originally thought yeah well what it tells us is that we have a good league going and there's lots of parity when you look at uh just the amount of different teams uh you know factored into the top 10 as well as you know so there's 31 franchises 21 of the franchises uh were were ranked at least once in the top 10 and at least once outside the top 20. So you can see, like I said, the, the variance there of the majority of franchises, there were only, uh, I believe three franchises that were consensus or two franchises only that were consensus top 10. And uh, none of the franchises, not even one was a consensus top five where every single vote said, Hey, this team is a top five where most leagues, you kind of know who the best team is and, and at least a couple of the teams are going to be one, two, or three on every vote. But here, you know, we had teams, uh, one team was uh, as high as number one and as low as number 19, another as high as number one, as low as number 24. So I think part of it is everybody's still getting to know the league, getting to know the rosters, getting to know the scoring system. And we haven't had a lot of fantasy gameplay to really judge how these rosters stack up other than just straight name value, looking at the players. But to see that kind of variance that three of the, you know, three of the teams that got first place votes were also voted, you know, outside the top 15, outside the top 20. It tells you one thing and that's parody is alive and well in the ultimate fantasy hockey league. And when that puck does drop in January in the NHL, hopefully they're still hammering out their deal. But once that puck drops, it's going to be very exciting to see how these power rankings hold up and, and how these franchises actually match up uh, within the scoring system. So let's walk through the top 10 here. We got uh, number one, the, the powerful Grizzlies, you know, they, they won the regular season last, uh, last season. So there uh, obviously seems to be one of the teams to beat out there. Then we have the Yetis and red army sitting at third, I guess, you know, I don't know if Luke was building more for the future or for now, but uh, did, did you expect red army to be in the top five? Yeah, I think red army certainly took a future outlook at the start and accumulated a lot of draft picks and has a lot of young talent, but just in recent weeks and months throughout the off season, he's really flipped a lot of those future assets for current star players, bringing in guys like John Carlson and, and now Drew Doughty added to his defense. He's got probably the best goaltending tandem in the league with Carter Hart and, and recently acquired Igor Shesterkin. So I think you look at what Luke's done. He's kind of got uh, a real good base for the future, but he's turned a lot of that future into present. And I think he's flipped the switch to win now. And, you know, he's a, a one of our personalities in the league. And when he's, he was the franchise that was ranked first three times and also ranked 19th. And when he saw that 19th, he got eager. And, and that's where he added Drew Doughty and acquired Igor Shesterkin. So he might be closer to number one right now than number three. So 
certainly Red Army uh, is a contender and has a bit of a, a bright future with a lot of the young talent, but is certainly capable of winning uh, in the present and in the coming season as well. And like I said, the Grizzlies, I think uh, the team to beat on paper coming out of last season, they were the inaugural Founders Trophy winners as our regular season champion. Of course, the Ultimate Fantasy Hockey League only launched on January 20th and gameplay was shut down on March 12th. So a fairly small sample size there, but uh, the Grizzlies had two members of the, the hottest line in hockey with Leon Dreisaitl and Ryan Nugent Hopkins of the Edmonton Oilers. So you look at uh, the foundation with the Grizzlies and, and some of the, and again, a team that's just deep at, at all positions. They've made some good acquisitions in the off season. A guy like Tugo Taravainen, who has a, a really good contract. So, and then the Yetis, I mean, uh, rounding out the top three, they have Connor McDavid uh, and really loaded up front with guys like Artemi Panarin and Mitch Marner and Brock Besser and Anthony Mantha. They really have uh, their top heavy in their forwards, but they're uh, a franchise on paper that uh, is looking like a force to be reckoned with, especially with that scoring system seeming to favor forwards a little bit. I think the Yetis are going to put up some serious fantasy points. So if we round out the top 10, obviously we talked about the Grizzlies, Yetis, Red Army, then number four, Strong Island, five Titans, six Ice Vikings, seven Rock Republic, eight Outlaws, nine Gators, 10 Monarchs, of course, winning the, uh, the Klein Cup and uh, dropping down now as, you know, as the, as the franchise owners and, and I guess scouts have ranked them number 10, but this is regular season stuff. And of course, we know the Monarchs did really well because they loaded up on the Tampa Bay Lightning. So any surprises in the in the top 10 that you, that you see there that you didn't expect to be in the top 10? Not necessarily. The power rankings played out quite similar to the way I sort of had my own running power rankings that I've sort of been adjusting over the last couple months and tracking. And I actually didn't submit mine because we did have 11 franchises submit. And I just thought it would be uh, best to let the franchises decide the power rankings. And that's the, the route I took with the approach I took. But for my own personal list, the, the two franchises that were low uh, compared to where I would have had them is Blades of Steel at 11 and the Bombers uh, way down at tied for 23. I thought the Bombers had a, a young core that, in my opinion, could be a, a top 15 uh, franchise. And uh, the two franchises that maybe were a little bit higher than I expected, uh, I'll say Rock Republic at seven, but not by much. I had them just outside the top 10 on my own list. And I think the reason Rock Republic is as high as they are is because they have the most future assets, the biggest protected list, a ton of uh, assets with their affiliated scouts, uh, Easton Scouting Solutions. So I think Rock Republic has all the potential in the world, plus a bunch of cap space to really, because uh, we're ranking these power rankings going into the season, but more or less we said, tell us how you think the standings are going to finish at the end of the season. 1 to 31 if no more moves were made or based on the, the assets that these franchises have. And, and Rock Republic has the most assets to potentially improve as well as cap space throughout the season. And they did land a, a big fish right before the power rankings deadline by acquiring Jack Eichel. So uh, Rock Republic, not much lower for me. And Tornadoes, they traded away their two best players, arguably, and Alexander Barkov and Dougie Hamilton. Uh, downgraded there right before the deadline for the power rankings as well. So they were at 17th. I might have had them in the, maybe I'd flip 23 and 17 and get the Bombers up there into the top 20. But certainly uh, top to bottom, when you get 11 entries and you average them out, there were some uh, sort of wild or sort of off board picks. Like I said, some had uh, teams mostly in the top 10. And then all of a sudden there was a 24 or a 19 in there. But uh, it, it averaged out quite well. And I think the power rankings speak to the general consensus within the league uh, heading into the 2021 UFHL season. So the, so the bottom three, and we don't have time to round out uh, probably everything and talk about the whole, the whole list today. Uh, 29th spot, North Stars, 30 Duckman's Dominations and 31 Dynasty and Dynasty for, for all good reasons. We, we, we certainly know about, but uh, geez, I don't know if Dean Millard's going to be happy about that. Do you think we'll get invited back on another one of his podcasts? I think Dean's playing the long game. All you have to do is look at the amount of draft picks he has in 2021 and 2022. Uh, and, and you look at high level scouting agency, uh, his wife and Craig Button scouting agency. They have guys like Shane Wright coming up that uh, Duckmans would love to have Shane Wright as their franchise player in two years. So I think that's intentional. I think Dean uh, made some moves to, to get an operating budget and to really acquire a lot of draft picks and prospects for the future, which again, if, if this blockchain 
uh, platform and, and UFF sports on the blockchain is only going to take off and grow year over year, I, I might rather be the team that's going to be the powerhouse in five years than the team that's going to be a powerhouse today. And I think that's the, the outlook and the approach that Dean Millard and Jamie Thomas have taken with Duckman's domination. So I don't think they, they actually got the most last place votes, one more than Dynasty. So they got five last place votes. Uh, so I don't think Duckman's domination is surprised by that ranking. And I don't think they'll be too offended because they're uh, well known to be playing the long game and having those future assets. Dynasty uh, had an ownership change. Uh, Xavier Smith and, and his affiliated scout, Brian Hernandez of California Cation Scouting and Analytics and Scouting. Uh, they've really been busy in the, in the month that they've had that franchise. And in my opinion, they've made great strides. Uh, I, I personally didn't have them in last place anymore. So I think they could be uh, potentially a few spots higher on the power rankings already. And I know they've set out a goal to potentially be a top 20 team uh, in this 2021 season. So it'll be interesting to see Dynasty's moves going forward. And the North Stars certainly have some big names, uh, Eric Carlson and Ryan Suter on defense, Carey Price in goal. So they have some franchise caliber players, but maybe the depth's not there. And, and one thing with those franchise players is they have big contracts. And we know this is a, a salary cap league and there's been some injuries there as well. So I think uh, the North Stars are, are a team that need to build out their depth. And they do have a good scouting, affiliated scouting relationship with Daltac Scouting Service, DSS. So I think uh, they're another franchise that'll trend up in the years to come if uh, they do finish towards the bottom of the standings and, and have a shot. Because remember, these teams that finish at the bottom, uh, if that's how the season plays out, are going to have the best chance at the top prospects uh, from the 2021 NHL draft, just like the real world does it in the NHL. So all these franchises have something to look forward to, whether it's prize money or potential uh, franchise players from the, the entry auction in 2021. So, no, you, you talk about uh, cap space and, uh, you know, a couple of the, the major acquisitions that I saw come across my desk in, this, in the past couple of weeks are exciting trades. Drew Doughty, uh, Red Army, Luke picked him up, but you already mentioned that. But he, uh, he comes along with a fairly, uh, fairly large contract. So, obviously, Luke has room in his roster and in the cap space for, for that guy. But that, that's going to add that, – that's a valuable pickup. It is. I mean, Drew Doughty is still an impact player in the present. He's one of the – you know, top uh, fantasy defenseman out there, but he's got $11 million cap hit for the next seven seasons. Uh, the Los Angeles Kings are going to trend up. They're going to be a, a team on the rise. They've had some down years, but uh, he's sort of one of the faces of the franchise there. And does he have seven good years left or is it three? And, and if it's only three, if you have to buy out those last four years, that's why all the other franchises were scared of the Drew Doughty contract. He was bought out, uh, released by his franchise prior to November 1st deadline when we implemented the, the NHL buyout system with uh, cap recapture going forward. So if you buy somebody out, you have to retain half that salary or a, a chunk of that salary over twice the length of the remaining contract. So Drew Doughty is uh, an impact player in the present, but a, certainly a risk for Red Army to take on a contract of that size that nobody else wanted to touch. But Knowing Luke and knowing uh, Red Army, if they need to move Drew Doughty, uh, them and their silent partner will find a way to move Drew Doughty. So uh, I think that's why Luke took a chance on him that nobody else was willing to take on that contract is he's confident if, uh, if Drew Doughty becomes an albatross or an anchor to his roster and he needs that $11 million in cap space, he'll be able to negotiate his way out of Drew Doughty and, and place him with another franchise. It was, it's going to be fun to see. Also, Darnell Nurse, uh, a big trade there. The Battlehawks uh, sent him to, I think, Strong Island and uh, went for a pretty good penny as well, about $550 US. Yeah, Strong Island's been active on that front, uh, taking over a franchise that had some good pieces, but really adding, uh, using uh, financial resources to, to bolster their roster. Uh, they Strong Island was the team that made the blockbuster with tornadoes to take sort of their two top players in Alexander Barkov and Dougie Hamilton for a thousand US dollars and then turned around and added another defenseman in Darnell Nurse for 550 US dollars. So we're seeing some uh, value, financial value attached to these digital assets already. And again, those numbers could look small in the future, but in the present, uh, you know, that's more than, than the Battlehawks paid for their entire franchise. And Darnell Nurse isn't necessarily one of their franchise players. So I'm, I'm sure uh, Battlehawks owner Serge is uh, excited about the return there, but at the same time, you look at Strong Island's roster, 
They were already ranked fourth in the power rankings. Uh, Red Army made the big move for Drew Doughty and, and Strong Island felt they needed to match that and got a guy in Darnell Nurse who has a much more cap friendly contract and, and he's younger than Drew Doughty. So certainly a, an impact player for Strong Island to keep them sort of in that top five in the power rankings. Absolutely. So let's let's change gears here just a little bit, uh, you know, in essence of time. So the American Hockey League and, you know, we're all eagerly anticipating to see if these number one, if these franchises can can last, you know, and well, they will one way or another. But it's just a it's a real strange situation with this covid going on. But we don't really know, I think, when the leagues are going to start. You might know better than me. But for all intents and purposes, now's the time to plan. And you know, it's fairly exciting. This is the this is the UFFS's new venture is to expand into the minor leagues, which we always want to do, starting with the American Hockey League. We're looking for some player selections. Yeah, that's uh, one thing we'd like to see more of in the present. Uh, we've extended the deadline on uh, selecting the AHL franchise players. So we put out a list of 135 players, and we'd like our UFHL community to pick 31 of those 135. And and we'll average them out. Whoever gets the most votes, the 31 top vote getters, will be declared uh, franchise players for the AHL. And the way we'll do it is the same way that the UFHL started, is those 31 players will be attached to a franchise and they'll be auctioned off, just those 31 players. Uh, once you've uh, been the winning bidder and you've purchased that player as your franchise player and you own an AHL franchise, then we'll draft out the rest of the 23-man roster. So 22 additional players underneath your franchise player will come through uh, an AHL draft. So uh, the AHL will mirror the real world AHL uh, as far as uh, every player who's in the AHL in, in, in the real world will be in the AHL on our fantasy platform. So only about, I'd say one in four or one in five AHL players, 20 to 25% are currently owned among those 1,920 players on the UFFS platform. So it'll be interesting to see if you buy an AHL franchise, you're going to own approximately half those players on your roster. So it's a pretty good investment to potentially get in. I believe the, the minimum bid or the starting price for these auctions is only going to be 50 USD, which is uh, significantly less than what we're seeing UFHL franchises uh, sell for. And certainly if you're a scout and you're registering players on the, on the blockchain, it's $20 per player USD. So, I mean, if you're buying an entire franchise for $50 and you're owning 10 or 12 players you can do the math as to how good of a deal you're getting to get it into this ufahl and but again it's all about growing the platform and development and it's not about making money off the, the ahl franchises we just want to get that uh growth and, and get that sort of uh inter, intertwine and, and grow out the the amount of hockey leagues because certainly there's going to be a lot of daily transactions back and forth from the UA, UFHL to the AHL and vice versa, as we see with the NHL and AHL. So that side of the platform will take care of itself once it's functional, but we want to get the, the right owners in place. And certainly we'd like to see the UFHL franchises uh, purchase an AHL franchise as their farm team. So they'll have first dibs and we hope uh, many of the 31 franchises will take advantage of that offer, uh, get a cheap AHL franchise hire a general manager who follows the AHL on a daily basis to run the franchise. And uh, you'll reap a little bit of rewards if that franchise is successful and profitable throughout their season. Yeah. It shouldn't be hard to flip those things for a profit down the road. You get in cheap, uh, build it up to something. And we, you know, if you, even if you search through Twitter, you can already find, you know, very passionate fan clubs and followers of the AHL. It's, it's very easy. it will be very easy to find a general manager or somebody that's, you know, the, the lives and breathes AHL to, to take care of that for you. A lot of synergies exist, obviously, between the UFHL and uh, and what will be the, the AHL, you know, formulation of this. Uh, leasing of players, you know, more transactions on the Zillica blockchain, more value to the score tokens, which you use as the in-game token. There's just a lot of positives to this thing. So, uh, yeah, I know you. that's all over Telegram and, and emails and still looking for player selections. Um, some other pretty cool innovations being thrown our way. Somebody suggested, you know, we did the power rankings on the franchises, but why not the logos? I would have never even thought of that. That was Dean Millard. That was Duckman's domination. Maybe he was, uh, uh, maybe he wasn't too happy with where he ended up in the power rankings. But what Dean said is that let's rank something we already know, which the logos are out there and, and all 31 franchises have logos. Some have been rebranding. Some might still rebrand. Re prior to the start of the 2021 season, but by and large, the, 
the logos, the jerseys, uh, secondary logos, those are all established. And, and certainly it is cool to, to look through. And I mean, I kind of, when he said it, I looked at the logos and I was like, wow, that would be, that would be hard to do because there's a, a lot of really nice logos in the UFHL top to bottom. So great idea by Dean and, and certainly something that, uh, again, because we've had so much downtime between the end of the, the, the Tampa Bay Lightning winning the Stanley Cup, the end of the NHL season and the uncertainty over when they're going to get going, which is likely two months away or a month away yet. So certainly there's some, there's some downtime. Why not uh, rank the logos while we're at it? And uh, just something fun to pass the time. And, and like Dean said, something that we know for sure, this is what the logo looks like. Cause it's hard to say what these rosters and what these franchises are going to do in the fantasy gameplay, simply because 10 of the 31 franchises haven't had any fantasy gameplay. They joined in July through the redraft and, and weren't part of the client cup playoffs. So they see their players on paper, but they have no idea how they're going to perform within the scoring system. So uh, the logos are there. We know them. So why not rank them? So I think it's a pretty cool idea and another way to pass the time, uh, maybe through the holiday season throughout uh, the world juniors that hopefully we get to see here in a couple of weeks as well. Yeah, you know, that's one thing I've always looked forward to doing over the holiday season when you have a few days off and you're drink, drinking your rum and eggnog and sitting back in your easy chair playing with your new toys and watching the World Juniors and everything's up in the air. Uh, I don't know if they've settled on an NHL starting date. They're talking maybe mid-January now. You know, the other thing they were talking about was a whole slate of outdoor games. And I, it sounds like it's really uh, kind of a long shot. And they're just coming up with innovative strategies, I think, to keep the game alive. Do you know yeah, anything about that? And to make revenue, right? Because the revenue is the big pinch on the owners. Half the revenue is is fan and, and ticket driven. So they need to get creative. And they've talked a lot about advertising on the jerseys and on the ice, which they haven't liked to do in years past and on the helmets. So we could see more of a, a European look to the NHL as far as some advertising on the jerseys and helmets and gear. Uh, and then the outdoor games, I think uh, just the potential of being an outdoor environment, you could get some fans in there, whether it's full capacity or partial. I know there was a, a boxing match last night in, in Texas in, in the Dallas Cowboys stadium. They had about 16,000 people there, which stadium holds almost a hundred thousand, but still they, they've managed to use these outdoor football stadiums, baseball stadiums uh, for, for some other sporting events to get fans in the building and generate revenue. And I think the NHL seen that and they want, they want to find ways to make revenue and, and outdoor games have always been profitable for the NHL. Even at half capacity would be better than an empty arena. So they're exploring all their options. They want to find ways to make revenue beyond the TV deal, which isn't as good as the NBA or the NFL or major league baseball's TV deal. So uh, the NHL does need more money from fans and certainly outdoor games. If they can get some fans in the, in the stadium, that would uh, help pay some bills. So they're going to get creative, but whether or not that comes together uh, remains to be seen. Well, you know, uh, I think uh, I'm, I'm getting sick of sitting here and, and waiting and waiting and waiting. So let's hope that they, they get down to the nitty gritty and plan something. You know, actually Edmonton, the Commonwealth Stadium would be a great place. That thing holds 60,000 people. So you could easily have social distancing and put on a game in there. And I'm, I'm sure they're probably looking at it as well. Winnipeg, another good candidate. Yeah, especially with COVID and, and the uncertainty and the timeline with the vaccine and how that would work for entry into sporting events and and festivals and everything else with live music and stuff. Uh, everybody's looking at uh, trying to get creative and think outside the box. And certainly outdoor games is something that the NHL has done successfully for the last 15 years. So there's no reason that uh, they can't explore that idea. And I think we'll see a, a number of outdoor games uh, as sort of signature events of this NHL season upcoming. And I do think uh, by the time we reconvene for the next podcast in two weeks, we'll have, a very good idea of what the NHL's plan is as far as start date, schedules, outdoor games. There's going to be a ton of NHL news coming in the next two weeks. So we'll have a, a full slate of topics and, and exciting stuff to discuss uh, in episode 13 of the, the UFF Sports Podcast. And hopefully it'll be lucky episode 13 uh, with uh, all this coming together because there's also been talk of the opposite of, of uh, financials and stuff and potentially canceling the season. There's some fear mongering going on. Uh, amongst agents and, and owners and, and some battling there. But I think cooler heads are going to prevail. I think everybody wants to get this season in and, and get it started as soon as possible. So like you said, I'm looking at that January 20th area and, and hoping we'll have hockey by then. 
I was going to say, uh, hopefully we, we get to talk about some positives on the next podcast, number 13. So uh, I want to say thank you again, Fish, as always. Uh, it was great to have Blockchain Andy on here, our first cryptocurrency guest. Um, I Man, again, I could talk to that guy for hours and hours, and, and I'd probably learn yeah, something new every second that he speaks, I think, because as a crypto rookie, but I think a lot of our UFHL community members will be very happy to, to you know, better understand what, what he's got to say. And uh, of course, he's, he's always available. He's, he's involved in our Telegram chats as well. So anyone can probably ask him any questions they want. So I uh, want to thank to anybody who, uh, who is listening to this program. And hopefully that everybody's staying safe. And uh, hopefully they have learned more about what we're about today. And join us again in a couple of weeks for hopefully lucky number 13 on our UFFF podcast where you own the game.